Pittsburgh Section, National Council of Jewish Women, Oral History Number 2. Selma Berkman and Estelle Kroon are interviewing Joseph M. Katz on July 16, 1979. Would you please give us your name and address? <clears throat> Joseph M. Katz, my residence address at Gateway Towers here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Mr. Katz, in order to find out something about you, we'd like to know something about your background, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, any ancestors, grandparents, so forth, that you can recall. Unfortunately, <coughs> uh, Russian Jews, due to Pale of Settlement and possibly other rules and regulations and habits, kept very little history. And uh, although by instinct I'm a historian and have attempted to learn about Jews from the time of the diaspora on, I've learned very little bit little about my ancestors. Uh, <clears throat> my parents and their forebears have been born in Russia. However, I learned at a funeral oration of a relative some years ago in Philadelphia uh, who was able to trace the ancestry of my mother's side that they had fled the Inquisition and had moved, wended their way uh, eastward to Italy, and one branch had moved to Russia, and another branch had gone to Palestine. On my father's side, I could get very little history beyond uh, three generations ago. What was your mother's maiden name? My mother's maiden name was Averbeck. Her first name? Sarah. S-A-R-A-H? Yes. And your grandparents, did you know them? Uh, yes, I do. I remember my maternal grandparents, uh, Max Haverbach. Yeah. I remember visiting him in his factory in Chelsea, Massachusetts when I was a child of probably five or six. And my grandmother, who lived in Pittsburgh until she passed away many years ago. And her first name? Um, Bessie. Now your father's parents, you... Joseph, for whom I am named. And I'm embarrassed to say I don't recall my um, grandmother's name. I'm glad you asked the question. That, I'll research it. They were in Russia or they never <clears throat> came to the United States? My parents? Your grandparents. Uh, on my mother's Father. side, yes. On my father's side, he became an orphan at the age of 12. And uh, <clears throat> as a sad, almost macabre point of history in the family, uh, they lived in a town called Tamashpol. How do you spell that? Uh, T-A-M. I'll have to write it. All right. T-O-M-A-S-H-P-O-L. Russia. T Russia. Tomas Paul had been in Romania, uh, had been a part of Romania on the Russian border, but had been taken over in their uh, internecine warfare, fair is plural, and was then part of Russia. Uh, it seems that <clears throat> uh, his parents, my grandparents, were visited when he was a small boy of 12 by uh, <clears throat> various relatives, and unknowingly they had brought typhus with them, and the entire family was wiped out except two, my father and his sister. What business was this grandfather? He was a farmer, and surprisingly, <clears throat> if I may continue on the European history, uh, very keenly interested in family history, and I made notes for seven years, wanted to know about the weather, how they lived, what their habits were. Uh, I learned that my grandfather had owned a plot of land, which my father referred to as a farm, and everything being relative, I never really got the size of it, but because of Pale of Settlement laws, as you well know, Jews were not permitted to own land. It was owned in a clandestine manner 
illegally. And uh, <clears throat> it was in the name of my father referred to the man as the Puretz, P-U-R-E-T-Z. I've never gotten, some of the real definition of the term Puretz. I think it's a princely kind of name of a great landowner who was fond of my grandfather. And uh, <clears throat> at any rate, my uh, father, Samuel Katz, became an orphan at the age of 12 and supported his older sister, Frida, who preceded him in age by two years, and himself, and my dad told me he used to carry sacks of grain uh, that weighed as much as he did up a ladder into a barn. Excuse me, what did Puritz, Puritz, the landowner's name? No, that's a term. A in term, Russia. the Puritz. And in what Russia. did he do for your grandfather? He helped him own his land or what? He kept it in his name and away from the authorities. In his own name, in the landowner's name? In the landowner's name, right. You recall from history, in those days, landowners owned uh, <clears throat> provinces, maybe areas larger than Allegheny County. At any rate, <clears throat> my dad uh, continued to act as a farmer, and as a sidelight, after he moved to America as a youngster, I recall, wherever we lived, he had huge gardens, everything, including pig pigeons, chickens, geese, ducks. Uh, did your father have any education uh, in uh, Russia? No, no formal education. It would be unique if he did, because the Pale of Settlement Laws prevented uh, any Jew from attending a public school. They had to attend their own parochial mm -hmm. schools, which were primarily biblical learning. Right. He did that. Yes. And his religious education at that age, was he, or had his family been religious and taught him Judaism? Oh, yes, Judaism? absolutely. He was uh, an Orthodox, devout Jew until his death. Did he uh, meet your mother in Russia? Yes, he did. What was Apparently, her name? Her name was Sarah, Sarah. Oh, Aberbach, that's right. And her father was a uh, well-to-do, perhaps we ought to put quotes around well-to-do. Everything being relative, I suppose, if you were worth twenty-five thousand dollars, then you were a billionaire. At any rate, he was a uh, grain merchant. I suppose he plied his trade within the limitations of that period. However, he emigrated, <clears throat> uh, as many Russian ma males did, prior to their wives. He emigrated to America, I believe. Around, he told me he was here during the panic of 1907, so it had to be prior to that. But believe it or not, my grandmother <clears throat> and my Aunt Rachel and my Uncle David did not arrive in America until 1920. Apparently, like many breadwinners, he kept sending funds home. And they had all kinds of reasons for not leaving at that moment. When they did leave, it was at the outbreak of World War I. And they were in a German concentration camp for two or three years as they wended their way westward <clears throat> and left Rotterdam in approximately 1920 for the United States. In the case of my parents, and Selma, you raised the question as where my father met my mother. There are, the towns were adjoining one another, <clears throat> or very close by, mm -hmm. and the town was Yampol, I-A-M-P-O-L-E. I, I recall how startled I was one day. That's one town. Now what's the other one? The other the one? Oh, I see. My father's okay. town. Okay. And uh, these could be uh, signified as shtetls. Mm -hmm. And I recall one day listening to my car radio coming to my office during World War II, and I was astounded that the name Yampol, which in Yiddish my parents called Yampala, with the accenting and the, the E not being silent, that the Germans had come into that town. It was primarily, I learned, oddly enough, two years ago from my master at the Harmony Club in New York, who had just emigrated. He knew Yampol uh, intimately. 
but I can come back to another uh, <clears throat> moment when I discovered relatives in in Israel. See, unfortunately, we have very few relatives in our family. Our relatives could be counted on. Well, Many tell things. me before we go ahead. Now, your your mother had um, a brother, David, a sister, Rachel, right. and, and another an and another sister, Bell. It was the three of them and my grandmother, not mm -hmm. two of them, right. who came to America together, and it took them six or seven years to about six years to arrive. Um, part of the crosswinds of World War One. Right. Now your father had Wait. how many brothers or sisters? He had one brother and one sister. Did they ever arrive, get to the United States? Never. No. <clears throat> the brother disappeared during World War One. The sister remained in Russia. There was active correspondence between my Aunt Frida, whom I never met, and uh, my father up until sometime during World War II. During interaction and correspondence with his sister and others, he learned that my sister had passed that his, his sister. sister had passed away. Mm -hmm. May I just ask another question before you keep going? You said the two towns were near each other, but you didn't say did they know each other as children? They did not. No. When they met? As when? adults. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the last? That uh, your, the sister corresponded until World War oh, yes. II. Oh, <laughs> yes. They remained as Russians, and I understand that their children became distinguished uh, members in academia, lawyers, doctors, uh, scholars, and so forth. We have never had contact with one another. And even when Agnes and I went to Russia ten years ago on a visit, we had no way of tracing them. And their name is Katz, too, because my sister's maiden name was Katz, married a gentleman named Katz. Your father's sister. Father's sister. She is that the one that survived the typhus? Yes. Your father? My father and his sister survived, survived the typhus, but that brother who died, died before the typhus? The brother who disappeared. Disappeared. D disappeared before no, the typhus. he survived the survived typhus, too. too. All right, Coming uh, back now. Yes. And his name, can you recall that? I do not. It's a pity my sister Jeanette is there. She has more family history. I must tell you that I, I'm friendly with Jeanette, and I said, I'm going to interview your brother about She said, oh, you could have come to see me. I could tell you what she I She had, you know, I thought this mm -hmm. might relate to, um, as I said earlier, as a sequel to the uh, I Am a Book. And Jeanette, who is, there's no daughter that I can think of more attentive to her parents than Jeanette. Mm -hmm. She was there every single day except when she was on holiday, and even for years, cook. She had her own family to raise, and she would be privy to information, not that I wasn't privy to it, right, you but she was there constantly. Yeah. Uh, now, tell us about your uh, siblings, your uh, brothers and sisters. All right, uh, in the pre pill days, <clears throat> my mother, like, women of her generation had many children. There were six of us. And five of us were around with very active, very unfortunately, a favorite sibling, my brother Harry, was killed after the war. After he returned, he had a farm in near Butler and uh, was riding a horse one day, a new horse of his, and just accidentally fell off the horse and by a chance of maybe Thousands to one. He was kicked by the horse. He never regained consciousness. Your parents were married in what year? Um, let's see. I was born in 1913. They were born and they were married in 1912. All right. So you are the oldest. I am. And you were born in this same town of Taj Mahal. No, in Yampol. Yampol. I see. Then your father and mother. Lived. lived in Yampol. They may have lived uh, 
They may have lived with my grandparents. That I'm not certain of. You can check Jeanette on that. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, your father was not the farmer. He was in the grain business, possibly. No, he still so no. He was in the, He was still a farmer. I see. All right. Then the next uh, child. Um, well, <clears throat> let's see. Chronologically, there was Harry, the one I told you about, who was killed. He was after you. After me. Mm -hmm. And chronologically after him was uh, Emmanuel. After Manny was Hyman. Then Jeanette. And the baby of the family, William. Um, can you recall your early life? In, did you come directly to Pittsburgh? That's yes. The first question. Yes. When you were how old did you come here? Eleven months. And why did they come here? Good question, because I've researched that many times. <clears throat> My um, mother's uncle was a gentleman who had a jewelry store in Pittsburgh. His name? Uh, Louis Aberbeck. But he never lived in urban Pittsburgh. He was always in small towns. And I think that was in um, Hermony, Pennsylvania, which is somewhere at coal mining town near our country, near Westmoreland. Now, my father preceded my mother and I. And I think the story is very interesting. Being somewhat of, somewhat of a patriot, <clears throat> I was always uh, disenchanted with stories I'd heard about uh, Jews not trying to avoid the army. That was probably a major reason for emigration. But the deeper I studied it, following the assassination of beginning with Alexander II and the first great wave of pogroms was started in 1880, which followed the first revolution of immigration to America, where the hugest wage of immigration occurred in the year 1881. Continued through the, say, the Kushnev. Uh, <coughs> program of 1907, I believe. At any rate, uh, I was hoping my father wasn't involved in that. And fortunately, at least for my feeling, I was childish, I must say, as a mature, so-called successful man for even thinking that way. In his case, <clears throat> because he owned this land, and he was now about uh, in his early 20s, in right. 1881, you're talking. When are you talking no, no, about? I'm, in 19, I'm switching now to 19, uh, 13 or 14. 13. Uh, after I was born, <clears throat> uh, my father related this to me. Uh, you know, it was almost mm -hmm. like yesterday. I can just picture he and I being in his living room, and he is explaining why he, how he came here. A boyhood friend of his became the police superintendent of his village. And he came to him one day and he said, Sam, there's going to be a pogrom here tomorrow. I want you to tell your family to go into hiding. And they have already discovered you've been double-crossed, that you own this land, and you're going to be a target. We suggest you leave immediately and go over to Romania, which was nearby. And my father did that. He said he waited for weeks his news came back and forth. It was unsafe for him to return. And finally, in a family conclave, they didn't have telephones, I suppose. Somehow, however, they had their underground system of communications. It was decided that he would leave for America and come to a city called Pittsburgh because his father-in-law's brother had a jewelry store here and he could somehow put him in the commerce. And Mother and I came over in June of 1913. My father was telling me one day how fearful he was then because the Great War, which started on August 31, the rumblings that occurred during that period, there was fear of submarine warfare because, if you recall, few of us do remember it. I had a research history. I thought it was between Germany and other countries, between Germany and Russia. That was the start of World War One, And uh, 
we landed in the Boston Harbor and the proof of date and age and everything else occurred when I had one of my lawyers years ago go to the immigration department. I, I want to know the name of the boat That's, too. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, I got a <clears throat> Xerox copy of it. My name was in Yiddish, Yassel, Y-O-S-S-E-L, which is Yiddish for Joseph. And I was 11 months old, gave my mother's age, and uh, she came along with uh, a sister-in-law of hers. And what did the sister-in-law's name? Uh, her name was Fanny Averbeck. What was the boat's name, do you remember? No, I'm sorry. Her, the sister-in-law to be. That's uh -huh. right. She was single. She was. She came over here to marry her boyfriend, uh -huh. who lived in Pittsburgh, but came to Boston where the marriage was held. He was there to his read his bride to be. Hyman Haberbach, my mother's brother. He has long since passed away. It's interesting because for myself, I'm recounting family history. Right, yeah. Uh, now, as you grew up with all of the brothers and sisters, oh, can you uh, tell us something about your home atmosphere as to religious or economic and while, cultural while she, ideas? That while she's from? asking that, when they came to Pittsburgh, where did you settle and where did they live that the other children were born? Um, <clears throat> there were three of us who were in Pittsburgh first my mother, father, myself, and we lived on Kirkpatrick Street. There's an interesting sidelight of them in a zig and zag because things come to mind. In a recent director's meeting of mine, say within the last year, one of my directors who lives in Washington, was formerly a Pittsburgher, a very distinguished lawyer in Washington today, Leonard Marks, and he and I grew up together. We went to the same high school, Fifth Avenue and I together. We went to Pitt together. He went out to law school. So after dinner, he said he'd like to go back to where he lived. I said that's a great idea. I want to see. I want to retrace where I lived. So we went to his house. It was 245 Dixie <coughs> Street, and he was shocked. He hadn't been there in a generation. He left Pittsburgh before the war started, and he heard no about 1941. And he said, yeah, I thought we lived in the bigger house. <laughs> I said, all right, Leonard, let's, I'm going to tell you something. I lived at 1827 Cliff Street once upon a time. I drove a Rolls Royce down there about 10 years ago. I just got my car, and I know it's, I'm in the 11th year now. And I went to 1827, it's amazing how I remember that number, Cliff Street, which then I thought was a palatial street. Pre-World War One, and uh, <clears throat> I knocked on the door. First of all, I peered around the back. My father had a farm there. That house ran from here's Cliff Street, here's Arsena Street, here's a 17th Street incline. So the house was here. This was the house, and the land for a farm was equal to our parking lot here. Went all the ways back to City Block. I recall I even had a Martin house up there uh, for a bird lock. I remember as a kid, my pigeons were stolen. Well, at any rate, <clears throat> Marks and I went first to Kirkpatrick Street. That was now an empty parking lot. From there, we went to Robert Street. This is all walking distance, really. You know where that is? You I know all the names. Did you I live on Roberts? Did you live on Roberts? On Bedford mm -hmm. Avenue, really. On Bedford, you live. Maybe two doors. That's after Robert. Kirkpatrick. Quite. Then on Bedford By Avenue. that time, my father was prosperous enough to buy a house for $10,000, which he paid for without mortgage. And that was a block away on Cliff Street. On Cliff Street, uh huh. And what did your father do at that time? My father then was, uh, let's see, I'm going back. When he came to America, if I can start back a little bit, he went to my great uncle who had a jewelry store. He said, Sam, because you speak Russian, Polish, Slavish, everything but English, and Yiddish, of course, he spoke about six languages, but they were all languages that were melded into one another. 
be like a Swiss that speaks of no less than three languages to exist, you should be able to, I'll give you a satchel full of jewelry, go out of the country, can speak to these people. He became a fairly successful salesman. He made a lot of money, I don't know what that meant. Maybe $50 a week. And uh, <clears throat> now let's see, on Cliff Street, try to determine. Oh, I remember something. When I was a little boy, I must have been this big, three or four. Uh, he had a store now, a jewelry store, in Curtisville, adjoining Russellton Number 2. Someday I've got to have my driver take me out there. In what community did you say? Curtisville? Curtisville. That was um, a mining town. Apparently my father's customers were in mining areas. Right. And he opened the store then. I recall, I have a vision of a, a hotel a white frame hotel on a hill. My parents were awakened in the middle of the night and I got up with them. I couldn't have been over three years old. My mother claimed that even when I came to America, I was fairly fluent in speaking. And I would shop with her as a, almost like a semi-adult by the time I was about three. Of course, mothers always mm -hmm. exaggerate. <laughs> and um, I remember seeing the fire in all the people. I remember one thing. I'm 66 now, as of last week. So I have, that was 63 years ago. I will never forget this. These people loved my dad so much. <clears throat> they called him by his Russian name. I don't know what it is. And with their coats and everything, they tried to put the fire out. The whole block made up of wooden buildings. Barbershop, I think, and maybe a pool hall, jewelry store, grocery store, all burnt to the ground. And in daylight, and I'd been there all during the middle of the night, the morning. My mother probably forgot that I was there. These people went into the ashes and pick up a ring or a bracelet, walk over and hand it to my father. Today, that would never yeah. happen. Was, can you uh, recall your uh, early religious uh, environment or... Um, I would say it was atmosphere. poor. It was really poor because <clears throat> I was a leader of our family, fortunately or unfortunately, and uh, I had I had a very searching mind and didn't believe in the rituals as a small child, and I questioned. My father was always angry at me, slapped me, and everything else. And I I would say to him, "Now you're reading Hebrew. Can you tell me that open the book and what this word is?" He said, "Bang! None of your business." I wrote here the other day, Jeanette and Manny and Hi and I were at the Tree of Life for memorial service for my mother yesterday morning, Saturday night, and uh, your site. And uh, I said to Jeanette, you know, I can't even read an olive from a vase, and I'm trying to read the English and I can't get the real meaning. I said, you know, it's a pity that the service isn't in English so that we can understand it. And I said, I'll bet you there isn't one person in this room out of maybe 15 or 20. Who knows what he's reading? So, so those were my doubts now. in those days. Yes. As a result, I was a very poor student in Haider. But you were sent to Haider. Yes, but I don't, I think I played hooky all the time. And do you remember the congregation? Um, yes, I do. Uh, it was on Miller Street. It was the Russian show on Miller Off Center Avenue. I recall because when I was bar mitzvah, my father took me there so I wouldn't miss school. I went to uh, uh, Fulton School out of East End. And we got up very early in the morning, like 6 o'clock in the morning, to go down there. My father brought the traditional bottle of old overholt. Seems how they took everything neat in those days. And we went down there and I went through the rigmarole. And that was the last time I was involved in religion. Really, until one day Morris Balder called me when Marshall, who will be 40 next month, was six years old. And he said, why don't you join the temple? I knew the temple well. I'd been their scoutmaster. And uh, <clears throat> I said, in fact, I became an Eagle Scout at the temple. I was in the troop there. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm all Morris. I don't want to bother with it. He said, well, isn't your son going to go to Sunday school? 
told Agnes about it. She said, join up. So we really had no <clears throat> real religious training at home. When you Were you bar mitzvah? Is that when your father went with you? Yes. That was a bar mitzvah. Correct. But you observed the holidays and the... The principal holidays. Yeah. So we and always had a Seder at home. Did you um, have observe all the holidays at home, your mother? Only the... Um, my mother may have benched Lauch when I was a child, but I think at one point she stopped that too. Uh, we had a kosher home. My mother was much more broad-minded in that respect. My father really towed the line on that to a point that he wouldn't eat many meals at my home. His dishes were strict when he changed maids. He lost maids because he was so strict with them because they'd mix one dish with the other. In other words, would you say that your father was a, also a strict disciplinarian? He was. Well, no. I'd say a tolerant disciplinarian. And uh, he was religious. He became more religious. He wasn't too religious, I have to say in retrospect. Check Jeanette on that. Tell my brother Harry was killed. Him. Terrible blow to the family. I mean, all of us were. When years. was that? Uh, in May of 1946, he'd been in the service for years, and, and you know, when people heard out, he was yeah. killed, they thought maybe in the army. Just <coughs> killed. But did your father go back to religion, you say, after the death? More so. In fact, he was a president of a synagogue. In order to get him to, from being re-elected, I had a... From what, what congregation was your father the president of? Uh, the uh, Knesset Israel, K-N-E-S-E-T-H, Israel, on Negley Avenue. It was a converted house, and my father, I should say, my brothers and I, paid for the entire building and renovation and all, and sometimes surreptitious there, it was called a cat shul. But uh, he was very devout, in it. <clears throat> and it became, maybe it was part hobby, too. But uh, he had been ill for many years and uh, was devoting too much time to it. Excuse me. Well, your, was your family interested in, in music or uh, art in any way? I know you're an art collector in, now. In no way at all. Their prime interest was struggle. Uh, what about their political interests? Any, uh, Never heard of them. Nothing. Except that they were very happy to be an American, God bless America, and all of that, because they had spent their lifetime in servility, more or less, as all Jews did. Can you tell us about your education, your uh, grade school? You did say you went to Fulton School. I went to uh, Fulton School. <clears throat> then we became victims of a depression earlier than the official depression of, that began with the breaking of the stock market in October of 1929. We moved back to the hill at a house that my father owned, a very lovely house on Euclid Avenue. Oh, so when that you went to Fulton, then it was Euclid Avenue where you Yes. Were. And we moved back there mm -hmm. temporarily. The temporary move was about four years. And what street was that again? on Manaka Place. You moved from Euclid Avenue. Right. To mm -hmm. Manaka Place. And then, were you already then in, in high school at that no, time? No, I was entering my last year in grade school. So where'd you go 1927. then? 1927. That was McKelvey School. Where I had started. <clears throat> in fact, my parents were so busy raising children and working that I imagine at the age of five and a half, Entering school yourself, walking there, introducing yourself. My teachers there for years told me about my first appearance. Coming along. Mm-hmm. At McKelvey. McKelvey. Uh, I'll backtrack. I went to Lecce School for half a day, which was a block away. And even precociously, I have to say, and I, I may be very immodest in parts of this, uh, I didn't like this school. The same day, transferred myself to McKelvey 
two blocks up the road on Bedford Avenue because legally I discovered at that age I really belonged to McKelvey and not in Lecce. I was in Midway Point, a block from East School. So the very day that you started school, you changed I was in two school. schools, quite <laughs> right. And high school was at Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue High. And then you did go on to college, yes, University of University Pittsburgh. Yes, University of Pittsburgh, majored in journalism. What was Went in my senior year. What was your family's um, uh, opinion of that journalism? I could do no wrong. I see. Good. And you quit before in your senior year. Your senior year. <clears throat> I finished my major in, in journalism and my minor in history, and I was taking SNAP courses. This was in 1935, and I wasn't about to spend ten dollars of credit. It was it ten? It was three hundred a year. That's right, ten dollars of credit. Waste my time taking astronomy and French and a few other things. I was very anxious to get into the commercial world. I've never stopped working. <coughs> So where did you, when you quit, what did you do? Was it in the middle of your senior year or at the beginning of the senior year? Beginning. So I you didn't start your senior never year? Never started. Filled out all my cards. That was before the days of IBM. Took a half an day. You two were too young to remember this. You'd fill these three by five cards out of a sheet as big as, almost as big as this table. I was halfway through it. I said to myself, isn't this foolish? I have a $50 deposit. We're in the middle of the greatest depression this country ever had. I worked my way through school uh, having a print shop in the back of my house. I said, I'm going to move that downtown and spend full time instead of a full course at Pitt that was very active on the campus. I mean, as active as I was in academia. <clears throat> very amusing when Pitt trustees came out here to this, my boardroom here, invite me five years ago to become a member of the board of trustees. I said, if I accept, and you accept me, I'll be the only one in the history of your school to never finish college. They were astounded. They never had, they probably never had, had an undegreed person. So uh, while you were going to school, you had this print shop at your home? Always. Actually, my father, mm -hmm. for my 14th birthday, gave me a little Kelsey hand press. And I started uh, being commercial from that day on. And what did you print? Business cards, name cards, bill heads, letter heads, envelopes. After school, I'd solicit the orders. I'd go back and set type and print it, deliver it, collect the money. I even had Agnes, who was going to Peabody. At one point, I had an idea. Most of you may remember in high school, everyone had the name card with your name engraved or printed on it. And uh, I got a representative in every high school in Pittsburgh. I met Agnes Roman. I asked her if she wouldn't. She was a senior in her school at that time. No, wait a moment. No, no, she's a couple years younger, several years younger. Whatever she was, she was in Peabody High, and she solicited orders for me. And her last name was? Roman, R-O-M-A-N. Um, can you also tell us now anything about your health when you were a child, or the health care you received, or did anybody have any serious illnesses? I think we all, fending for ourselves, we had a family of eight, mind you, with our parents. <clears throat> no time for regular checkups or any of the things that our kids have today. And we had the usual signs that seemed to be on all mm. the houses, diphtheria, measles, whooping cough. Do you remember what you had? Um... I think I had the measles. I really don't recall. Do you remember Dr. Barenfield? No. It's a familiar name. That's, how That's my father, because Jeanette remembered him. Dr. Barenfield. Did he take care of that family? Jeanette. Did? Well, then she would know. She you know remembered Jeanette him. about the same age? Yes, I think. Mm -hmm. She remembered him. The name is familiar to me. Where was his office? Well, probably at that time on Center Avenue. That's where the doctors were, right. near Aaron Street. But do you remember, uh, you don't remember the health care then as a child? It's 
just to remember everybody was sick oh, and got well. Right. Every yeah. kid got a disease yes. and you were joyously at home. When you were an adolescent, what did you do for fun? <clears throat> Recreation. Uh, <clears throat> let's pick out ages. Oh, let's say uh, 14. Well, at 14, Athletically, I was interested in gymnastics, which happily had become a very popular today, and I was our city champ in high school. And uh, <clears throat> I was always interested in spectator sports, of course. Um, I would say my only athletic prowess was gymnastics, but I, it was 365 days a year for me, because mm -hmm. during vacation or on the beach or anything, I would practice every day. And how did you arrive at that interest in, in those days? In school, from school? In school. Uh -huh. uh, anything with music or art or that you are interested <clears throat> in now? Well, my parents forced me to uh, have Dr. Hershenson's father, we called it Professor Hershenson, teach me to play the violin. <laughs> and you didn't take to that too well? <laughs> How long did you play it? Oh, I think he came around for a couple of years. Once and who, who was it, Dr. Who, Hershenson? It's Dr. Morris, the late Dr. Morris Hershenson's father. Remember, with a big black sombrero hat. And we forced our son Marshall to do it, too. And his teacher is now world-renowned, Lauren Mazel. Yeah. Lauren used to come to her house on Inverness and teach Marshall as his father Lincoln did. Prior to that, but I think like father and son, Marshall gave it up too. Today he's very interested in music. He's a member of the board of directors of the Pittsburgh Opera and other things like that. Tell <clears> us <throat> about your um, courtship, marriage, children. That point. Yes, of your life. I dated Agnes, and uh, Agnes Roman. She had always lived in the East End part of Pittsburgh. She lived on Rural Street. And at that time, I think I lived on St. Clair Street, the hill we went back to I see. East End for many, many years. <clears throat> when did you and meet her? Meet her? Well, I think she was going with a friend of mine at a party, and uh, I must have called her there after I left the call, and we dated for a long time. What year were you married? 1937, August 12. Uh, and your children, of course, Marshall. Marshall was born in 1939 and Andrea in 1942. Right, can you tell us about Where were you living then? Uh, when you first married, married, when you were first, first married. married, 414 South Graham Street. You know, I remember Dr. Barenfield now. I talked to Jeanette as to how old we were. Right. Dark hair with a mustache. I think he always had, has a mustache. Always. We must have been very small children then. Your father <laughs> practiced 50 years ago or more. Oh, sure. Um, you lived on South Graham Street when you and Aggie were first married. Correct. And then when Marshall was born, where did you live? Uh, King Avenue. That's up by Highland Park. Uh, tell us about Marshall and uh, a little bit about his uh, life. Sure. <clears throat> Marshall, uh, as I say, was born in 1939. Just a, uh, well, he was born on September 17th, just about a month few weeks after the war started, and uh, <clears throat> he was raised differently than we were. The struggle wasn't there, and there were less children to get involved in. I suppose if uh, instead of having six children, my parents had two, things would have been different, but I would never have wanted them changed. Poor Jeanette, the only girl out right. of six, <laughs> we murdered her. <laughs> She's she so sweet, well. though. Yes, she's very sweet. And uh, Marshall is married to... Marshall is married to uh, 
very lovely girl, Wallace Fisk, from New York City. And they have children? One child, Lauren Sarah. Lauren Sarah? Yes. And at this point, how old is she? Nine. And your daughter? She's married. Andrea is married to Jeffrey R. Jeffrey Plessett. They were childhood sweethearts. Charlie Plessett's son. I know. I know. He lived around. We lived at, on Inverness. So they lived around the corner of Fair Oaks. And um, <clears throat> they were married about ten years ago. They have two children. My beautiful granddaughter Nicole, who is eight. No, will be eight. Sorry, is seven. And that wild man Jonathan, who will be five. Where do they live? They live on Linden Avenue. Then from King Avenue you moved to Inverness? From King? Uh, no, from King we moved to Euclid. By a quirk of coincidence, about three or four doors away from where I lived as a child. Wow. And then Inverness? No, then, to, uh, then we moved to a house on the um, corner of Stanton and Beatty. And in 1944, to Inverness, where we remained for 23 years. Selma, where did you live before your palatial home presently? On Albemarle. For 27 oh, we years. Mm -hmm. And from Inverness to Gateway. How long? 22 years well, on Inverness? Well, a little different though. What did you say, 22 years? 23 years. 23 years. <clears throat> In 1960, we bought Paul Getty's apartment in New York, and uh, <clears throat> we were spending so much time there that actually, even today, our social life is divided into two, two complete sets of social lives, New York City and Pittsburgh, maybe more so there, because we spend a great deal of time there. should say there's more leisure time there than yeah. here. But it's mainly social, not business, or... Business oh, it's, connected. it's business for me, but yeah. it, it isn't the 9 to 5 or 9 to 7 or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a little different there. And um, we have a large apartment mm -hmm. able to home. With the result that for, we thought that would become our principal home, and that we'd have a pied de terre here, which is our present apartment, which, unfortunately, we're buying this week. Yeah. It turned uh -huh. us into a condo. I just talked to their sales manager. We'll probably buy it and sell it at a loss a year from now. We're going to look around for one of the new ones that are being built. However, this building you're in now, which is the largest plant in the city of Pittsburgh, a million square feet, <coughs> was under construction about the time we were thinking of making New York home number one and Pittsburgh number two. Well, it never turned out that way. So... <coughs> We live in both cities, but for tax purposes, as your husband well understands, I prefer to be a Pennsylvanian. Right. Uh, I guess then you've always been in the um, journalism, printing, and, and that sort of business. How did Creative you... Creative business. Right. Now, let's get to to this business. <clears throat> well, this one's been <clears throat> widely written up. So, <clears throat> I can almost read if I went to some of um, well, let's see, you want my business career? Yes. I would say that it started, I was always entrepreneurial. As a youngster, like a lot of other kids who sold things house to house, I was the leading Saturday evening postman by area. I remember once running into the publisher of the Saturday evening post and told them I was glad they made them skinny now for kids. When I was there, and it was a Nicola copy, it was creates of an inch thick. thick. And I used to sell so many of them. Got to a point that I graduated to selling subscriptions. I was 10 years old then. On weekends, I had always earned about $100 a week doing all kinds of things. I had made money since I was a kid. I never stopped. And uh, <clears throat> at any rate, actually, all my businesses were a progression from one to another, and none of them 
could be called conglomerating because they were somewhat related to one another. Because I've always had a bent both in art and journalism. And even when I went to Pitt, I tried to enroll in Carnegie Tech, the main member, and Pitt. Major in art there and journalism here. Because my forte was an interest in art. Actually, I was an artist as well. In fact, the Pitt Panthers for two years had my covers. And, um, <clears throat> and a writer. However, that wasn't permissible then. I tried to get the school to put it through. I even had my journalism prof try on my behalf. At any rate, <clears throat> uh, there was a progression of my businesses, so my present enterprise really has its roots away back there. First, my little hand printing press. Then when I left school in my senior year, I moved the printing press and added more. It was down at Tel Lotte Falk, that the building she's in now, 244 Boulevard of Allies. I had the eighth floor, 800 square feet. Agnes became my secretary then. She tells everyone that I had to force her to hold depositing of the weekly check. I think it was about 9 or 10 or $12. That is 1936. And uh, <clears throat> I was always restless and never stopped. And I realized I don't like to get that much ink in my fingernails. And uh, I admired the people who came around and sold me paper. I only wore a necktie. I said that one day, I'm going to the paper business. My family said, where are you going to get the money? I said, don't worry about it. I'm going into it. And I started in the wholesale paper business selling printer's paper, and that was called Printer's Paper Supply Company in 1937. Printer's Paper Supply Company. You started that? Yes, because I didn't have the capital <clears throat> to get franchise lines like Hammer Mill Pond or Cranes Crest. So what were you sell? You started the Printer's Paper Supply Company and sold what? Fine paper is the classification is called the printers. And what I did, I went around the paper mills all through the United States. And I said, I want to buy anything you can't sell. But I need long-term credit. I have no money. And there's one man that I befriended later. On 1937, one of my trips took me to the big paper-making sector in Ohio called the Miami Valley between Dayton and Cincinnati. Big paper mills like Chappie were there. And I went to one in Franklin called Miami Valley Coat Paper Company. <clears throat> I walked in and audaciously asked for the president. And uh, this fellow came up and became very staunch friends in the oncoming years, a fellow named Albert Sreri. How do you spell that? S-R-E-R-E. S-R-E-R-E. I told him what I wanted. He said, well, we've got a lot of that around here. Why don't you and Sig Oppenheimer, who is a refugee from Germany, who is his assistant, company, he accompanied me. I went all through the mill, and I selected what Sig said was four carloads. Mr. Surrey said, now, how are you going to pay for it? Are you giving me a check in advance? I said, I have no money. I said, you're going to have to give me credit on how you think I look and act, and I don't think I'm worth $500. And uh, <clears throat> and he said, well, can you pay me in a couple of weeks? I said, no, it'll take me three months to sell it. I'll give you a note, and I'll put all the interest on that you want, and I'll pay you the day it's due. I paid him about three days before. Mm -hmm. But I bought paper for three and four cents a pound, and ingeniously, I say that today, found new uses for it. For example, I bought some purple cover paper, a carload of it. You could, couldn't sell that in 15 years. I decided that would be great for restaurants, for menus, found new uses for paper that the mill didn't think they'd normally sell. So the type of paper you selected was writing paper, or what was it? Writing paper, cover paper, book paper, letterhead paper, things like that. And uh, <clears throat> I paid Surrey before it was due, and then became his biggest customer. Now, he, was, he had owned, he told me, he never got married until he was about 50, because he owned 29 paper mills, 
And the 29 is a number I remember because he was on a train 29 nights of the month. Had no time to meet women. He owned so many mills all through the country. He was a tycoon in the field that he went bankrupt as a result of the, uh, the bubble that broke. He had a contract with Collier's Magazine and a contract with Scandinavian pulp makers. He kept up his end of the contract, but when the bottom fell out of the newsprint market, Collier's found a legal way of getting out of theirs. And he couldn't meet his obligation. He lost all his mills, but one, the one I visited, because his good friends in Dayton, where he was a leading citizen, had participated in ownership. And he was in receivership. He told me years later that after he sold me that first lot of paper, carloads of it, <clears throat> he was almost fired by the receiver, the Franklin National Bank in his town, for giving me credit. They drew a D and B and they saw Nothing. I had no assets. <laughs> Zero. <clears throat> but years later he came to see me and he said, Joe, I want to get out of the receivership. I need help. I said, How much money do you need? He told me like called my secretary in to bring my personal checkbook in, wrote a check out for it. He said, well, how much interest do you want? I said, hell, nothing. I owe you. He cried like a child. Poor guy died. I attended his funeral about five or six years later. <clears throat> he was in such rags. I tell you, I just happened to think of this. I remember I helped him on. To me, he was an older man. He was probably in his early 50s then. I was a kid in my early 20s. And I remember helping him on with his coat one day, one of my trips in the lining, in shreds. Married a marvelous lady, who was one of the Jewish social leaders of that part of Ohio. He was he was Jewish. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Odd name, S R E R E. Yes. Almost sounds like he he could have come from the Middle East. His family could have. So you started off. On credit, and then how gradually did you build up? Um, <clears throat> it got to a point I became restless again. Why mm -hmm. should I be a middleman? Because mm -hmm. I have a creative bent. I want to do things. Why should I sell paper to people who want to do things? And I didn't want to compete with that printers because I'd be back where I was. And I'd be competing with my customers, which would be unfair and side to the morality of it. I'd lose it. World War II came along. I was having lunch with someone at Coffins one day, and uh, <clears throat> I said, what's new in the story? He said, well, we do an awful, we have a victory center on the second floor. We do an awful lot of, of um, <clears throat> military paper with all the kids in the Army now, people were writing. And I said, let's take a look at it. So after lunch, we walked down there, and I took a look around at boxes of crates and Montag's writing paper. And then also portfolio of this leather embossed. And I said to the young lady behind the counter now, do you sell many of these portfolios? She said, well, for every few boxes we sell one. Then I said, they have to buy two things. And the soldier that's close in quarters doesn't have space. And right then and there I got an idea. And I said, now how would you like to get a box of stationery? With the top built like a desk, with a blotter and leather at corners. And all that would be good. So I told my friend who worked in the conference, I said, take me to whoever is a merchandise manager here. And he took me to Maurice Sanger. You remember him mm -hmm. years ago? Mm -hmm. And uh, Sanger said to me, uh, well, Katz, what do you think this would sell for? And I trying to figure out the cost. I had no idea what the department store markups were. I said, well, how much do you need? He said, 40%. I said, well, it could sell for 98 cents. He said, how about making us double that, giving us more merchandise and everything? I said, fine, give me an order. Make, give me an order for a gross. We won't make anything on it. We'll make it. And he did. And what did you sell it for? It sold for $1.98. It sold to him for $1.17. That's 40 off. That was the beginning of really a whirlwind new business career, because for the first time, instead of being local and regional, I used to call on printers to sell them paper in the Tri-State District, say down to Bolero, High and Wheeling, and so forth. Now it was national. For the first time, I was visiting department stores throughout the nation, 
I sold every one of them. No one I didn't sell. What was it under the name of anything special? Yes, Joseph M. Katz and Kelly. <clears throat> and, and these packets or boxes were called what? That was called the Wright Kit. Became so, one how do you of spell it? R I T E hyphen K I T. Capitalized, of course. And I patented it. <clears throat> and it became one of the best known items for servicemen throughout the world. I ran into people for decades who remembered owning it. Or they so were it was just a, a box of writing paper with a with blotter. a leatherette with a the top was a blotter and it was made of a very heavy duty cardboard covered of course. Mm -hmm. You could almost stand on it. And uh, I had my brother Harry, who's a good looking guy in uniform, one day when he was back on furlough, pose had him downtown a photographer and it showed him lying in a bunk, writing on it, another one writing on his knee. And that, it was tremendous. I think I made a million or two million dollars out of it. May I ask you a question? Uh, you talk about going from your printing to selling paper to this. Did you discontinue the printing when you went ahead or did you continue yes. doing it? Quit. Did you stop selling paper when you went into Quit. this? All right. Not to compete. So it wasn't it wasn't a, a an enlargement then. It was continuing right. in a new business. But it was really a continuation in the form of the former right. business. I became, as I said, Surrey's biggest account because one day when I was down there, I was watching a machine making a paper <clears throat> prior to calendaring it. The paper's coating's got a rough finish. Then it gets calendared with a highly polished finish. And it looked like it would make a great writing paper. This was a book paper. <clears throat> so I tore some sheets off the machine, took it into his office, and wrote on it, and it feathered, you know, the word spread. I said, gee, what a great paper, but the darn trouble is you can't write on it. He said, we can chemically treat it. And he did. I created something called Suede Tone Pastel. We sold, we could have used two paper mills I'd put on it. And what was that suede tone pastel? Suede what tone was it? Pastel a paper? Was social writing paper. That's after your, but that's in addition in to addition your. In addition to, or I expanded Wright Kit to go in the social mm -hmm. end so that when the war ended, right. it would continue because Wright Kit <clears throat> had printed on the letterheads the insignia of the Army, like Air Force, uh -huh. Navy, mm -hmm. and so forth, Coast Guard. And uh, then, of course, it's very easy to sell. You didn't have to be a master salesman. There's a big shortage. Is Wright Kit still sold at all to the military? No. <clears throat> that ended. And then, after the war, you went into social writing paper then? No, that no. was during that period. Oh, I see. So then, when after Wright the war. Wright Kit made so much money, I expanded it. So, Wright Kit uh, discontinued after war. Right, as I discontinued the entire stationery business. It had gone down to one year, I only made $116,000 profit. I said, that's too small for me. Mm -hmm. But during the war period, when I was really coining money, but frankly, I wish I knew her husband then, because he'd have incorporated me. I paid, like, personally, like four or $500,000 in tax one year. And I've been incorporated properly, it would have been less. At any rate, <clears throat> I wasn't a pauper, but... I Pittsburgh Section, National Council of Jewish Women, Oral History Number 2, Selma Berkman and Estelle Krumen are interviewing Joseph M. Katz on July 16, 1979, Side 3. Please tell us your name and address. Joseph M. Katz, Gateway Towers, Pittsburgh. Now we were talking <clears throat> about your business. During the war years, I expanded my stationary business to a point where I had a rather uh, wide line sold to all of our customers. But it was during the war period that I realized that we were getting this business simply because we're a war baby and there were shortages. And, and when the war ended, I felt the department stores were our principal customers like Macy's and Alpha's and Marshall Field and so forth would go back to their pre-war suppliers. So I researched everything in the creative paper field and decided to go into a business uh, which was different than anything we'd seen. It's a rel relatively small industry known as gift wrappings. 
I could have gone into it both financially and actually then, but there was a war production board order that prevented anyone from going into a new business that consumed paper unless you were in it in 1939. What year was this? Well, I'm now in 1945. So after VJ Day in August of 1945, I decided we're ready to embark. In the meantime, we prepared designs and we're all set waiting for the legal requirement. And when the order was abandoned in Washington, then we went into it. In the natal day of Papercraft Corporation, it was then called it was September 25, 1945. Was, was paper uh, hard to get during the war? Anything, I mean, the supplies of making it? Uh, it was very difficult right. to get it. Yeah. <clears throat> Fortunately, I got it. When I was a wholesale paper merchant, so to speak, preceding that, I made great friends with paper mills, never chiseled them on price. And when the war started and they were giving allocations, I got excellent allocations. So in September of 45, right after the war, you started Craft Corporation with the idea of going into wrapping. graphics. And you would manufacture your own then? Yes. The following year, <clears throat> We bought the building on Center Avenue, where we remained for many, many years until 12 years ago. It's now a distribution center of ours. We have 25 of them, or 30 of them. That's one. Here, it's the only one we have in Pittsburgh. And um, <clears throat> the business continued to prosper. We were innovators. The gift wrap business, as it's known today, was my brainchild. It's, a, it's an entirely different field today. It's a big business today. Before before this, I don't recall, what was that kind of a business like? Small. Very when small. When people gave a gift, they just gave a gift in a box, a bag? Well, they, they used colored tissue papers or they bought paper that cost two for a dime. I innovated putting paper on rolls, then putting rolls in a box. In the theory that the, the housewife, unsure, of her ability to choose an inartistic, perhaps, had confidence that the manufacturer had creative people, happened to be me, who selected these designs. Therefore, they had a good selection. And uh, from then on, our company went like this. And uh, <clears throat> as we prospered, and uh, I was looking into the cloudy crystal ball of the future, I wondered where would we get our capital Further, with restrictive personal taxation, couldn't pay yourself more than an X amount of money. I wanted to be honest about it. And I decided the only way we could really move forward was to become a public company. At that time, I was very active in an organization my son is active in today called the Young President's Organization. And your nephew, Marshall, is active in it. And uh, <clears throat> I was a national leader in that organization. Joined it in 52. Very, very active in it. And the big hot issue for years was going public. I recall one day attending a seminar down at Greenbrier on going public. And while I was listening, I made up my mind, I am going public. So that night, going to New York by train, I had Milt Schapp, who was our governor until recently, he was with me. And uh, Chester Bland, an old friend who lives in France now, <clears throat> on the train. Milt had already started a company called Gerald Electronics Public, and the other fellow was one of the early conglomerate tours. And I said, fellas, I'm going to show you my balance sheet and operating statement. Like most private companies, we're pathologically secretive about it. Only the IRS, my account, my lawyer, my family know it. And here it is, and their eyes pop. And Milt said, if my company were like that, it would sell for $4 a share instead of maybe $2. So I went on to New York and saw a friend of mine. I reminded him of the incident at a party two weeks ago. He's now the chairman of Sun Chemical. What and, was his uh, name? Norman Alexander. And I said, Norm, how do I go public? He said, well, I have two great friends, Lehman Brothers and Eastman Dillon. 
I said, which one do you know the best? He said, Eastman Dillon. I said, call them. I want to meet them. Made a date for me. Went over and met these bankers who were one of the titans of Wall Street. And uh, incidentally, years later, after I'd gone public, they said, A, we were the only Jew they ever had up until that time that they sponsored, and B, the smallest company they ever sponsored. What and was uh, Norman Alexander the head of? Sun? Sun Chemical Company. Was he not Jewish, nor? Yes, his real name was Eisenstadt. I remember when I asked Margie one day when they changed their name, I said, what's the like? She said, it ain't easy. We've all forgotten it used to be Eisenstadt. I think his brother, his older brother, changed the name prior to that. And he's very Jewish. Then you became public. <clears throat> In December of 1958. We've been public 20 years. And uh, like some of my personality, we were over the counter, as all public companies are at the beginning. We usually graduate to high school, what's called at the American Stock Exchange. I said, I never want to be on the American. I want to go to New York. They said, you can't. I said, I'll wait. And I did. In January 1963, we became listed on the New York Stock Exchange. I can't believe it. It's 16 years now. Then we started acquiring companies on a very limited, selective basis. Will you mention some of those? Yes, I would say the first uh, <clears throat> acquisition was um, LePage's, which I bought from Johnson & Johnson. The company celebrated its 100th anniversary two years ago. Strangely enough, J&J, &J, which then did a half a billion, they're probably two billion now, uh, couldn't make a go of this company. They bought four years before. They lost $8 million in one year. <clears throat> I turned it into the block in 60 days. They were too big. It was ripe for a small entrepreneurial type of company to acquire it. Then the next company we bought was a plastic manufacturing company that we run in New Jersey. American Universal, Inc. That was American what? American Universal Incorporated. Incorporated. And what do they make? Plastic? Plastic tablecloths. See, that was the 66. Uh, the next company we bought was a company I courted for nine years. That was CPS Industries, <clears throat> based in Chicago, with a very big plant down in Nashville, Tennessee. We acquired them in uh, December of 67. And what do they do? They were in the gift wrap business. Gift what? Gift wrap, just as we are, but different than we, where we sold the masses they sold the carriage trade, mostly department stores and gift shops and that. They were an old established company. They were 52 years old at the time we got them. And they were losing money. We, in the first year of operation under our staff's guidance, they made twice as much money as they made in their 52-year history in any one year. They were suffering from the malaise of eight, which is not unusual. Of a second generation. <clears throat> First generation, I gathered, was dynamic. I never knew them. Second generation were too interested in the world of art and social sciences, spent more time on the UJA than on their business. This was also a Jewish firm? Yes, Weiner for the principals. How do you spell the name? W E I N E R. My maiden name was Weiner, W I E N E R. W-E-I? W-I-E-N-E-R was my name. We pronounce it Wiener and you pronounce this Weiner. Depends how you pronounce it. The German pronunciation is E-I is I and I-E is E. I forget which way they spell yeah, it. But it was Weiner. <clears throat> All right, uh, then. Are there any other uh, companies that you've acquired? Yes. Oh, we had a lot of trouble with that company. The United States government decided that we were forming a trust. With this, um, by acquiring another gift wrap right. company of this stupid lawyer down there, 
who mm -hmm. said, gift wrap is gift wrap. I said, no, our company makes an, uh, something like the Chevrolet automobile, the masses. They make a Cadillac. For is a it specific. finer paper, finer wrap? Yes. Oh, yes, the designs and everything. Our customer is Mrs. Blue Collar America. Their customer was Mrs. White Collar America. Well, this kid down there, you know, they've got lawyers there who can't make a living anywhere else. He said, oh, I can't tell the difference. I think you're violating Section 7 of the Clayton Act of 1906, and uh, therefore we want you to sell the company. Well, we thought morally we were so right and they were so wrong, and they were so ignorant. You know, it's a shame to pay your taxes on April 15th when you have dopes like that working for you. And we fought them for years. Marshall, my son, was in charge of <clears throat> a great deal of the battle. And uh, finally, uh, the government said to us, if you don't sell it by a certain date, you're going to have to spin off, <coughs> bless you, Excuse spin me. off their shares as a dividend to your shareholders. However, if you do that, if you own 1% or more, our family owns an awful lot more than 1%, you have to sell that within six months. Well, there'd be no market. It was silly. We just give up with donated to the public. So at the last minute we sold it for about $12 million. I mean, it was ridiculous. Our asking price was what did you sell the and a half million. What did you sell? Uh, the CPS? CPS. We were forced to divest it. In what year? In um, the end of 74. So you don't own that one anymore? Unhappily. Um, while you're doing all this building of your business, you are also active in organizations. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to get yes, to that? Yes, I think we should, because uh, we are interested in that also. Uh, Jewish and Christian, we're interested in all mm -hmm. that you did, your community involvement. Well, I recall when Agnes and I were interviewed by Town and Country, remember they had their mm -hmm. Pittsburgh edition, they had their picture by a lot mm -hmm. of other people, and uh, <clears throat> their interviewer, an awfully sweet girl named Pat Linden, I remember it only because she wrote me the other day, said she's doing a survey now, and she needs women to fill out this, and she said there's about 50 or 100 of these, and my secretary immediately distributed. She was so marvelous that she wanted to know how many organizations I'm involved in. I never knew. So I took out the then current issue of Who's Who and uh, looked at them, and I didn't realize it. I counted. I was on the boards of 23 different organizations. You still are? I suppose so. I'm really on letterheads mostly because I can't have time. I don't yeah. have time. The most of my time on the outside are really spent in two organizations Boy Scouts of America and um, <clears throat> University of Pittsburgh. There I'm on their executive committee as well as their board of trustees. Which I'm one, the Boy Scouts or the Pitt? Pitt. At Pitt, I'm also... Uh, University, you're on the board, and what else? And on the executive committee of the board. I'm also chairman of the board of visitors of the uh, school of... Uh, the faculty, rather, of arts and sciences. See, one of my members just died. Teddy, Teddy Hazlett. Mm -hmm. What a shock. <clears throat> I'm also uh, a member, not the chairman, Bob Kirby, Westinghouse, the chairman, uh, of uh, the Graduate Business School at Pitt. I'm on the advisory committee of uh, <coughs> Sister Jane Scully School at Duquesne University. And finally succumbed to join another one at the University of Miami and delivered a talk on mergers and acquisitions two weeks ago. There. And you're on the advisory committee there, or just giving talks there? Where? At University of Miami. Oh, just, I talk at universities, so, mm -hmm. on that subject and other business subjects. Usually my subjects are inspirational to let these kids know there's great opportunity despite high taxes and everything else. I've been able to prove that some of the most generous people to charity in America, Jews particularly, were poor during the 30s. Right. But it's perseverance and hard work. Sure, I have one friend who's worth $800 million. He didn't even have enough money for tuition in the 30s. Now, the country's replete with that. 
Well, I mean, loads of other things. Scouting, I'm, I've been on the board there for many years. I'm one of their numerous vice presidents. You set up the national or local board? Local. Yes, local bike. We're um, starting a camp there. It's going to be sensational when it's finished. It's called Heritage Reservation, part of scouting. We had a quiet fundraising drive here for four and a half million. We've already raised five. Okay. And what is the camp to be called? Heritage? Heritage Reservation. It's their union town. To be one of the largest camps in the country, hundreds of acres. We're building a, a, a um, lake right now. It's unbelievable how they build it. Talk to Bruce. You know Bruce Thomas of the U.S. Steel? Bruce called me the other day. He was down there. <coughs> They're damming up a valley. In eight months of normal snow and rainfall, they'll have a lake about a mile long with a depth of over 60 feet. Can't believe how much we had rain like yes, yesterday. Yes. It would take a month. Now, in the Jewish organizations, I know you run some boards there too. Yes. Uh, <coughs> I've been on the board, but not an active attendee of uh, our local federation. Here. Let's see, when was I chairman of the campaign? In 60 and 61. So I've been on that board, say, for 18 years. You were, you were the years. chairman of what? Uh, the uh, annual campaign for two years, 60 and 61. You're not now as active, right? Uh, I'm on the board, mm -hmm. and I've always been an right. advisor for now, what the other? board or other, Montefiore Hospital. All right. Now, let me see. You want me to turn this off? Let me just get down to the point here. Well, some of the things I've been interested in, I've been active in the state with the governor. Was the you mean chef? When chef? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, the governor. <clears throat> I've been on the... Um, the state planning board. Don't go too fast. I've been on the national cabinet of the United Jewish Appeal. I am presently a governor <coughs> of the American Jewish Committee nationally. Also on a number of their committees nationally. Uh, let me move along here. The state planning was for what? State Planning Board. Of what? Of, of the, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I'm a trustee of the National Foundation of Iliitis and Colitis. Well, I suppose a number That's, of others. That I gives us an idea. That's right. Mm -hmm. But now, also, we were going to ask you how you contrast the way you raised your yeah, children. Yeah. You started that and then did and the way you were way. raised or the <clears throat> times. How, di how different would that involve? I would say Pittsburgh? I was raised with a lot of all our children with great love and care. I ne never remember my parents ever having an argument. And there was not great privacy in our house when mm -hmm. you've got eight people. Yeah. But I don't think parents are like that anymore. I mean, we're living in a different world. Fortunately, our kids, Andrea and Marshall, <coughs> bypassed the problem a lot of youngsters had here with the problems we read about and hear about. And I would say Aggie and I were strict disciplinarians with these kids. For example, I was telling Jeanette and Harvey yesterday that Marshall went to Kiskey Prep School. After about a year, one weekend that he was home, I said, Marshall, uh, how are the movies there? Don't you go to movies there? He said, well, the kids always go Friday night. I said, well, you go every Friday? He said, no, I've never been to one. I said, you? We always went to movies together. He said, well, the movie cost $1.75, and I suddenly realized his allowance was a dollar and a half. Never complained. I remember one thing Marshall wrote me for a graduation present. <clears throat> He and his roommates, parents pitched in, paid their way to Europe on a trip. Marshall, by then, was an old hand in Europe because we've been going there for over 100 trips since 49, and he'd gone over many times. But I'd never been to Israel. <clears throat> and he wrote me in 61 when he was graduating. And he said, he made a comment in there I never realized until then. He said, you know, we're not very Jewish at home, 
I think you and Mother ought to come over here and see this pioneer country that I'm visiting. They've taken a boat from Naples over there on their whole tour of the continent. These kids had a very limited budget, believe me. And they lived in, they slept in their bus. They had a mini bus and traveled all through Europe. In fact, one night they went to a uh, a body house that charged only 50 cents a night. That's where they slept. Uh -huh. Some of the French artists of the 20th century lived in those places. Um, are you ready to ask about his art collection? Yes, we want to know about how that started. How you were interested in art. You said you were as a young boy. Yes, I never and stopped. How you started your collection and all that. All right, where does one begin? <clears throat> I think in the world of art, you almost have to be born in it. You have to start very early. If you're an artist, you had to start drawing when you were a child. I don't think I don't know in the history of art. There's anyone who started as an adult. Um, <clears throat> I always acted as an artist. In fact, they painted signs, slightly apart, but still somewhat artistic as a youngster, commercially, while I was going to grade school. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> when I could really afford to start buying art, was probably a little over 30 years ago. I recall when I lived at 5901 Stanton, my next door neighbor was Gus Bastheim, who was the owner of Wilkins Jewelry. Remember that place? Mm -hmm. He was an old Dutchman. Gus Bastheim. Mm -hmm. B-A-S-T-H-E-I-M. And, uh, you know, he was a generation older than I was. And yet we had a camaraderie talking across the porch from one another. And after he died, Florence's widow said to me, said, you know, you always admired that painting over on Mantle. I'm selling everything. You'd like to have it. You can have it. She named the price out. I'm delighted that only. Poor Gus, during the war, he brought his relatives over from Germany. And the quote of him, he said, those bastards never appreciated anything. No one ever thanked them but one gave me this painting from his collection. So it was my first decent painting. I don't remember the subject. I don't own it anymore. And uh, Aggie and I started going to Europe in 49. Very few Pittsburghers by then have you've been going unless they went pre-war. In fact, I spent like five years writing itineraries on for friends. At any rate, we spent a great deal of our time visiting museums on drag her along. She became very interested. And uh, we started collecting. And Paris was really the place to collect. New York didn't become an art center until many years later. In fact, I lost the bet on which was the leading art center, and it was confirmed that New York was. And I had to interview <coughs> the editors of Art News and Art World, and also about a dozen, to win, try to win my bet, about a dozen uh, art dealers from London, Paris, and New York. And I lost. New York is number one today, too. Yay. At any rate, I started collecting. <clears throat> and I must say, I have a pretty good eye for it. In my opinion, if you don't know whether you like something or not in a millisecond, you're finished. Nothing will help you after that. Same as you women. You look at a dress immediately. You like it or reject it. Or in sculpture, you may need five minutes because you've got five sides with a head to look at, top of the head. And uh, I started collecting the school in Paris and uh, would deal only at a cardinal rule, which I'd never broke but once. And that is, I must only acquire art from the most reputable dealers in the world. Why did you decide on that? Because they could prove provenance if I thought anything good, if it turned out that it was a fake or anything like that, I'd be able to come back and see them. And I remember one year... Aggie, I just thought maybe you had an unhappy experience. I never have. <clears throat> Agnes called me one day, and uh, she had been reading that book called Fake. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And I had gotten the copy as a gift to her. She hadn't known I had it here. She was in New York. And she said she got up in the middle of the night after reading that skinny book, she walked all around our salon, in our dining room, everywhere. Said, you know, I'm beginning to worry about these. Are you <laughs> sure these are good? I said, I thought of the same thing. Yeah. But we have no Matisse. Yes. Especially it was Matisse. I know the dealers, he really rooked. 
you know, he even faked, the, if you'll recall, he faked the, um, the uh, not only the pro, not the provenance, but the, uh, oh, the bills mm -hmm. and the authentications had those faked. Mm -hmm. So, um, at any rate, <clears throat> art was in one direction at that time. About 1959, I decided to change our collection in another direction. I gave away a lot of the art. I gave a raft of it to Marshall School, and much of it is still up there. There's an Albrecht where? Kipe at, uh, uh, I forget the name of the uh, museum, they changed their name, but that was at Cornell. Hmm. Well, now, why did you decide to change the the type of paintings? Is that what I it was? can't tell you the reason. Well, what did you collect? The what first? was it originally? Well, I had English. Uh, <clears throat> I had some of the English school. I had a great Romney up there, which I bought for nothing at a Park Burnett auction. In fact, I called a Pittsburgher who owned Dick Duddle. I said, "Anytime you want to." Told him I paid seven hundred fifty dollars at auction. I'd written down about three thousand. And there were only two bidders, and there must have been 500 people in that room. I opened the bid at $500. There was one lone voice by $50 increments. So when I called Mr. Nuttall, whom I never met, even What was his name? Richard Nuttall, N-U-T-T-A-L-L. -L. He was an investment banker with Moore Leonard Lynch. And uh, <clears throat> he, I said, I couldn't get over why, how low the prices are. Why didn't you buy them back? The guy really was an old-timer. He said, I felt it would be unfair for me to buy anything back. My children weren't interested. And he said he didn't even attend. It was a two-night auction. It was the only thing I wanted. Mm -hmm. I never attended the second night. Do you still have that one or you gave no, that one? No, I gave to? that to uh, Fairleigh Dickinson College. He asked me if I had the receipt. I said, yes, I have it. It's in glass. He said, that's worth $5,000 alone. Peter Romney the brother of uh, George Romney, the artist, who did this painting in 1764 when he was 30 years old, gave a receipt to the sitter, a male. Had this been a female, the thing would have been worth $100,000 then. Hmm. Because Mr. Mellon bought Emma Hamilton for 430000 during the Depression. <coughs> male <coughs> pictures of all the four portrait painters of England, Gainsborough, Romney, uh, Reynolds, and... Uh, our friend I just talked about, were worthless, but females were very valuable. Oh. That was before the era of photography. This mm -hmm. is how they took them. Mm -hmm. So you bought, and then you changed the more contemporary taste? More contemporary, more of the active 20th century painters, and I divided them into two classes. <clears throat> One, the unknown painters, and second, the autograph painters. Now, one gets fooled very easily by buying an autograph, because if you buy a Picasso, good or bad, it's Picasso. Renoir, it's a Renoir. And uh, I couldn't afford to buy only one group alone. And I thought that aesthetically it wouldn't be right to do that, because you're not taking a chance. It takes courage to acquire art from unknown painters. So I would say that for a long time, I was one-third known painters, two-thirds unknown, then it switched to two-thirds known and one-third unknown. It's like finding a stock, like an IBM or a Polaroid, but no one heard It's a gamble. <laughs> yeah, it's a big gamble. Very right. few of them make the grade, you know. <clears throat> and your local painters never make the grade. Has there ever been a Pittsburgh painter who ever made it? Mm. Never. John King. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. The house painter. Correct. He and Grandma Moses were probably the yeah. two best primitives in the country. Jeez, I never thought of that. He's the only one. I've seen some of Sam Rosenberg's paintings elsewhere. But he's not known. No, but I've <coughs> seen it elsewhere. Great painter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely great. Um, <coughs> it's a shame he didn't have... See, a painter needs sponsorship. Mm -hmm. But Picasso, if Picasso didn't have Daniel Con Conweiler, he may never, he may never heard of him may not have even lived to be 92. But you need to sponsor. And uh, Sam didn't have any. There are no local galleries. You really have to be in New York or Paris or London. 
at any rate, uh, <clears throat> I would say that the peak of our collecting occurred during the 60s. And the availability of more personal money had an awful lot to do with it. But I had a private company, couldn't borrow anything from the company under IRS rules that would be taxed as a dividend. But in a public company, <clears throat> I kept getting dividends. And I had much more wherewithal than before. Now, is most of it in your apartments yes. at this point? Or here? First, no, nothing here. Well, there's a is a collection <coughs> that encourages local artists and sculptors. And every year, for a number of years, and we have, I don't know, 100 paintings in this building, I suppose, uh, <coughs> we attend the exhibition that, you know, all the local ones are running up, three of them, Pittsburgh Plan, no, Arts and Crafts. But the best one we found is Associated. Three Rivers got a little better this year. And in recent years, so Rowena Bear tells us, we've been the largest buyer at the Associated for the last five years. The artists here are very good. We have a great group of local artists. Their prices are far too high. <clears throat> we support them regardless of their prices. Because for very little more, you get a nationally known artist. And for a little more than that, an international So every year artist. you buy some... This year we bought about eight. In fact, that pickering on the wall here is one that we got this year as you walk in. So the paper craft collection is all local? Yes. Oh, well, there are a few. There's a Montagnese there I bought in Paris many years ago. I have a few that belong to me personally, like a big sculptor. You know, the big sculptor in the lobby as he came in. The moving? Uh, the, uh, oh, the Aronel. No, the Aronel. No, the, oh, the, the big huge, one. Yes. Uh, bronze. That belongs to me only because there's no room in either one of our houses. For but it. otherwise you have them in both your apartments. Yes. Our New York apartment has a principal thrust <coughs> of art primarily because all my visitors know art. Here very few do know art. But um, I had an appraiser who recently spent about a week looking getting me a new insurance appraisal he likes my Pittsburgh collection better than New York. He's wrong. In New York, I have always like uh, going in my living room now. <clears throat> Renoir, Salvador Dali, uh, De Carico. I think my De Carico is one of his better ones. Chagall, Lemanc. Great Laurentian. Just read. First time I'd ever read the Marie Laurentian was sold at a big number at a public auction. The biggest art auction, you may have read about it recently, was at uh, Christie's or Sotheby's, no, Christie's in London two weeks Sotheby's. ago. Brought in $9 million on 20th century art, impressions and 20th century. And for the first time that I ever read about a Laurentian, $565,000. My Laurentian that I paid $3,400 for from a great gallery about 20 years ago. No, probably about 16 years ago. Done in the 1920s. A gem, museum quality. I'm going to have my insurance man take another, that is my appraiser, another look at it now. At any rate, <coughs> zigging and zagging, zagging, the art that we have here, my son Marshall and I both select jointly. He too has an interest in art. In fact, he does paint and sculpt. Did you I see saw the sculpture he did outside. Out there, that looked like Sandy. Uh, yes. What's his name? Who died last year? Um, hmm, the Mobile Man. Oh, oh Calder. Uh, Alexander Calder. Calder. Right. Yes. And uh, I recall about. I think his date is seventy-three. I scribbled right. Marshall yes. a note from London. I was coming home in about a week. I said, Marshall, we need an heroic-sized sculpture. Can you design one for me? So when I came back to my office, there was a cardboard one painted black this big. I said, that's great. And he had a uh, some foundry here do it. You know, most sculptors don't do their sculpting. That was really a shock to me when I learned that. They will do the sketch, and then have commercial people do the mold, and, of course, the bronze work, and everything else. Some of them never touch it. 
Now tell us why you picked this site for this particular uh, uh, or is there no reason? <clears throat> no, there was a reason. We needed a lot of land. Because the view is just magnificent to begin with. Well, that turned out to be very nice. My brother, Manny, who then was our vice president of manufacturing, he retired by the time our building was finished due to ill health. And uh, <clears throat> he went all over the city. I said, why don't we go near the airport? So much land there. And I'm, all, I'm at the airport once or twice a week. Save me time. They found this. And, you know, the, the Sylvan Beauty, this mm -hmm. unspoiled part of America, books. and we've won first prize, the most beautiful plant in our city, and all kinds of accolades when we build it. Trust. We're on 35 acres. We use all of it. Our plant is nearly a million feet, and the rest of it's parking lot, and then this driveway around our plant is actually a mile. Well, I've never been here, but I had an Israeli veteran about four years ago who came with the group, and they loved every minute of being there. Was here a group here in, recently? I know. With your, this was the lunch in the uh, the boardroom, and uh, they came home with uh, wrapping Hanukkah wrapping. Oh, wrappers. yeah. I'm sorry. I wasn't. I missed them this time too. Uh, they were here about three weeks ago. About fifteen of them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how do you view? your successes here and the Jewish community here and your life in Pittsburgh, how do you want to sum this up as to your life and the Jewish community and the general community? Is that a fair question? Oh, that's a difficult question to answer. <clears throat> I'd really have to think about it. Uh, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't want it to be any different. I have a great advantage over my son and my daughter because I made it. However, they may do better. The Marshall is striving to outpace me. He became the president of his company, and uh, someday, if I decide to take it easier, he'll run the whole show. He almost runs it now. He's only had it for about seven or eight months, but he's been with the company since he got out of school. Now, getting back to your question, Selma, I would say. When you talk about the Jewish community, we've been, you know, thick and right in the middle of it. When I ran our campaign, we were glad to get a million and a half dollars in the campaign. This year, we're shooting for seven and a half million. We just had a meeting of our little power group recently. <clears throat> uh, the general community in Pittsburgh is superb. Are you accepted into the other the big corporations? Oh, Do you feel any anti-Semitism or anything? No. They're all my friends, every one of them. If I need, you know, any favors. Recently, I wanted to get a new law firm for something special. I decided the guy that's always telling me how much money he's spending on law knows better than anyone. So I called Bob Kirby at Westinghouse. Bob said, I'll call you right back. And, uh, <clears throat> no, their, their anti-Semitism, I've never seen it. I really never have. I know it has to be there. I hear stories about it. I would say that if I were a Christian instead of a Jew, I would have probably uh, made things happen easier. Or faster. And more quickly. On the other hand, maybe not as skillfully. I wouldn't have been as hungry. Then, do you have, a, do you have any information you'd like to add to this? Uh, can tell us how you view your accomplishments here in Pittsburgh? <clears throat> now you want me to be uh, modest. That's impossible. I'm not renowned for that. And uh, I'd be... I really wouldn't feel comfortable responding to it. Oh. I'd say it's been great. You've enjoyed... You've enjoyed... Is there the something else you would like to do? Let's put something... You know, no, I've often, that you, know, you haven't done yet. That's a very good question. No, not at all. <clears throat> uh, I've often thought about this so-called retirement, and uh, I personally don't believe it. And corporately, we have no mandatory retirement in our company. In fact, in our program for retirement for pay, uh, we have many people who have retired and continue working, so they're getting full retirement pay and their salary. 
I've often thought if I decided to uh, say if I sold my company, you know, we get an offer every month to buy it for that herd of prices, <clears throat> and I didn't want to be with new people anymore. I could keep myself busy, so busy, not doing anything new, but just doing the things that it's I do. Attending, for example, I just can't attend all the community meetings that I should. And that old saw out of the sight, out of mind is true. People don't see me. How often do you see me, Selma? I am so busy, corporately, and your life, you have to make up your mind. <clears throat> for example, Jesse Cohen once said to me, a couple of years ago, we were sitting next to each other when I was getting a get the name of that word, the Spectre Ward. And uh, I said, I don't know how a lot of these people who we usually know around the country spend that much time at community activities. They do. Their business suffers. Absolutely. How many does. people are employed here? Well, we employ several thousand, but in this plan here, maybe 800. I see. Uh, you mentioned the award, the Spectre Award. What are other awards have you won? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> I guess all the Jewish awards. Man of the Year, I was right, I was there. I shared that twice, I got the Man of the Year award. I guess I got all of them, only because they run out of people. No, I don't think that's uh, in, uh, the gen in the community, <clears throat> I was one of the first ones to get the Salesman of the Year. It's sort of a mundane title. But from those whom? who followed me, pardon? From whom? It's from the um, executive group of Pittsburgh. I was the third one to get it, but the ones that followed me were fellows like Henry Hillman, uh, Don Burnham, who used to be the chairman of Westinghouse, uh, the new young Irishman down here who now had signs, uh, O'Reilly, Ed Gott, who was formerly the chairman of U.S. Steel. Uh, that was, well, I had a number of those kind of awards locally and nationally. I've had a number of awards, too. This year, the most signal honor that I was paid was uh, I was named as one of the 63 best chief executive officers of American corporations. And I was in good company. In Pittsburgh, the only one that was named was uh, Chrome George. But he got the second rating. I'm, I'm really inflating myself. This at the is the moment. chief executive officer of. You were one of 63 best chief executive yeah, officers yes. of, of the national, what, corporations? I'll get it. I'll get it. Yeah. Um, and I was the president of that. The Eagle Scout Association. Scout Association. Tony O'Reilly, who happened to be our chairman that night, a delightful fellow. You know him? Yeah. He's new to Pittsburgh. He's 41, and he looks like he's about 20. And he's the head of Heinz today. As of oh, July I've 1. heard of him, yeah. yes. So he gets up in front of everyone. He's sitting next to me. We're gossiping all evening. I had this picture that was taken years ago. And uh, he said, uh, Joe, this is your bar mitzvah picture. I think you ought to get a new one. So when I congratulated him on his job recently, he said, true, his is his bar mitzvah. He looks too young. He's got to get a new one taken. I want to get the name of this. This is called the Chief Executive Officer of the Year. This was in the Grand Ballroom of the Waldorf on in March this year. Uh, what was your other question? The name of this award. The Chief Exec... One of 63 <coughs> Best Chief Executive Officers of, of a year. Corporation. Correct. In the United States. Mm -hmm. Right? And are there any other awards you want to tell us about? Or have been. I just can't. I was right. on the dais or something recently. No, I wasn't. Right. I didn't get an award. It was just an honor. Well, if you find any, you can mail it to us. If you find any, you want us to put it in. Any here. Importance. All right. And otherwise, I think that we've covered, unless you have something to add, we appreciate this very much. And well, we think we have a very good uh, uh, history here. And we I appreciate, appreciate it. the opportunity. Is there anything remember? you would like to add or to? Uh, Point out. If I get a script, a question. that's when I might be able to take oh, yourself. Yes. All right. All right.